I swapped out my Mac Studio for the Framework Laptop 16 as my video editing rig. There were some lows. What? Oh my god! Some highs. <laughs> oh, yes! <laughs> now we're working. And a few revelations. All right, I guess that fixed everything. All this to determine if this innovative laptop is the right pick for serious video editors. Let's find out. Hey guys, CJ here from Elevated Systems. For the past several days, I've been using my new Framework Laptop 16 for all the work needed to run this YouTube channel. And as you might guess, a big part of that work is editing the videos you watch. For the past three years, I've been using my base model M1 Max Mac Studio and it's been fantastic. Say what you will about Apple, but when it comes to content creation, their ARM-based Macs are tough to beat. But that's a story I did in another video. If you're curious about why I switched from PC to Mac after nearly 40 years, you can check that out. But today, we're going to see if the framework can handle my editing workflow. No canned benchmarks here. I'll be editing the actual footage I capture and the videos you see on this channel. Specifically, I'll show you how this laptop performed while editing the Framework 16 unboxing video I posted last week. If everything goes well, the video I'm filming right now and you're currently watching will also be completely edited on this computer. So we'll dive into the actual editing performance in both DaVinci Resolve and Premiere Pro. But first, I'll quickly go over the laptop specs, the complete editing setup, and the footage type I'm working with. Now, feast your eyes on the top tier Framework Laptop 16. It's been decked out with a Ryzen 9 7940HS and the dedicated AMD Radeon RX 7700S graphics. I've thrown in 32 gigabytes of DDR5 5600 memory and a hefty five terabytes of storage across two SSDs. For the visual real estate, I'm rocking an LG 5K by 4K ultra wide display connected via USB-C directly to the laptop's rear alt display port which taps straight into the dedicated GPU without putting extra load on the system. Initially, I thought this setup was just for DisplayPort pass-through, but the LG has an integrated USB hub. Plugged into it is my mouse's RF dongle, and since the mouse is working without a hitch, it looks like we've got USB data pass through. However, the connection doesn't support a second display. The LG allows for daisy chaining a second display, but unfortunately that option doesn't work for the framework. For this reason, I won't be able to capture my display externally like I usually do. So I'm resorting to pointing a camera at the screen to capture my editing process. The laptop can connect to a third display via one of the expansion ports, but that routes video back through the iGPU and bus, causing measurable amounts of system demand, which I'm trying to avoid. Now, the rest of my peripherals are routed through a QD USB 4 hub. For the audio, I'm using a Behringer DAC and a pair of Persona Studio monitors. Short of that, I have my Sennheiser HD headphones because the Framework 16 speakers, while an improvement over the 13, lack the soundstage for video editing. Not that you can actually hear them over the system fans. For internet, I'm using the Hub's 2.5 gigabit ethernet connection. The Blackmagic Speed Editor is a part of the Ensemble 2, though it's giving me a bit of a headache. I have to reconnect and repair the device each time I try to use it, and my Keychron keyboard won't connect. It enters pairing mode, but the laptop just can't see it for some reason. When it comes to shooting, I have a dual camera setup. My primary is the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema 6K Pro, capturing all my A-roll and tripod-mounted Studio B-roll in full-frame 6K Blackmagic RAW at 8 to 1 compression, 30 FPS for A-roll, and 30 or 40 FPS for B-roll. For anything handheld or shot outside the studio, I turn to my iPhone 15 Pro Max using the Blackmagic camera app to snag 4K ProRes 422 HQ HDR log at 30 or 60 FPS. For the unboxing video, I went overhead with my Panasonic FZ80, keeping it simple with 4K H.264 8-bit MP4. It's worth mentioning that I capture and edit directly from USB-C drives, like the Samsung T7 or M.2 SSD housed in a USB-C enclosure. 
I aired some disappointment in my unboxing video about the 16 screws standing between me and the internal M.2 slot. The dream was to record straight to the NVMe and then slot it right into the framework for editing, but it turns out the T7 speed is more than up to snuff for all the footage types I throw at it. I'll also let you know that there are no hardware media encoders or decoders for the B-RAW or ProRes built into this laptop. DaVinci Resolve uses the GPU and OpenCL to process the codecs, and Premiere Pro kicks the B-RAW footage to the CPU for processing, so we're definitely going to be putting the laptop through a really good real-world test. All right, let's talk about the editing process, and fair warning, it was a bumpy ride before things smoothed out. What the f***, f dude? Now it's f***ed up again. Everything kicked off without a hitch. I zipped through the A-roll footage on the cut page with my speed editor, slicing dicing at the same speed as on my Mac Studio, but then as I started to weave in my B-roll on the edit page, that's when the trouble started. Scrubbing the timeline turned into a sluggish, jerky nightmare. Playbacks would lock up, yet the playhead marched on, turning the simple task of finding my key points into a real challenge, trying to mark in and out points on the clips in the preview window. Oh, there's no way I can edit this. That also became a test of patience. Switching my timeline to 1080p did offer a brief respite, but the relief was short-lived. Thinking the PC was choking on the ProRes HDR footage, I went all in and created proxies for those clips, but that didn't crack it. So I went the whole nine yards and made proxies for all my media, over two hours and an aching patience later, even the quarter resolution standard definition proxies couldn't salvage the day. Backbacks, proxy, prefer proxies. Let's go half resolution. And now we can. Oh my god! Oh. With the sun setting on my patience and the day, I had to throw in the towel with the framework and reboot my Mac to finish the job. Now, I'm no quitter and serendipity had it that the next morning kicked off with an issue on my Unraid server that needed fixing. Seizing the opportunity, I decided to whip up a tutorial video and what a perfect scenario to put the Framework 16 back on the bench for the edit. This project was a cakewalk on paper, just a four minute video, mostly 1080p OBS screen capture, which I captured on the Framework and a dash of ProRes HDR B-roll. The initial cap, was again a breeze with all the B-Raw, A-Raw falling into place in no time. I jumped into the edit page, starting to arrange screen captures and B-Roll effortlessly. But in this 14 minute out of focus clip, oh, the joys of a one person production team, you can't see it, but the smooth sailing hit choppy waters as the timeline performance dropped. However, by dropping down to a 1080p timeline, I managed to finish the edit. However, the color page revealed a new challenge. The scopes were blank and Resolve couldn't output the media. And then, ah, f Come on, I'm on the 1080p timeline, dude, seriously? Obviously, I wasn't happy as it was looking like the RX 7700S was struggling with even a short 1080p project. But after a reboot and a coffee break, I was back at it and I was able to grade my footage and EQ the audio, even applying the AI powered voice isolation and dialogue leveler track effects. And despite the VRM being packed to the brim, I was able to complete the entire edit, switch back to 4K and render out the video, which the framework did in just over six minutes. After wrapping up in Resolve, I shifted the 4K timeline over to Premiere Pro, and the difference was like night and day. Oh, yes. <laughs> now we're working. As I navigated through the timeline and rescaled clips, the improvements were striking. The timeline was butterly smooth, scrubbing and playback were flawless, not a hint of freezing, stuttering, or crashing. With Premiere leveraging both the discrete GPU and the robust Ryzen 9, the editing experience soared beyond what I encountered in Resolve. 
I'll confess my color and audio work in Premiere wasn't as deep as in Resolve. I laid down a, an adjustment layer with a log to Rec. 709 LUT and some essential corrections for my area roll, and then applied one of the basic audio presets. Premiere breezed through outputting the project in just under six minutes. If we're judging by render times alone, it might seem that editing on the Framework 16 is a toss up between Resolve and Premiere. And if I remove the AI audio filters and the more demanding power window nodes from the color grade, it makes it more apples to apples. Then Resolve actually renders the project faster than Premiere, but as we've seen, Resolve was pushing its limits while Premiere handled it all in stride. However, this isn't my final conclusion because after spending some time digging into the system performance stats and observing how each of the programs interacted with the system resources, I found that while Resolve should use system memory as a kind of a cache, moving data to VRAM as needed, which explains the few seconds delay when jumping several minutes forward and back on a timeline, that wasn't happening here. As soon as I loaded up a project, even before I interacted with the timeline, the VRAM was instantly filled. Then I remembered something from a conversation in the comments of one of my Mac editing videos from a few years back, and I decided to try it out. I opened up the AMD driver software and disabled smart access memory. Now, when I loaded the Unraid 4K video project in Resolve, to my awe and amazement, the timeline performance was exactly what I expected from this laptop. Jumping around on the timeline did require a few seconds to buffer as I described, but once it did, playback and scrubbing were buttery smooth. The system managed to keep the VRAM buffer below the eight gigabyte minimum, so there were no more GPU full crashes. Encouraged, I loaded up the complete framework unboxing video project and put it to the test. I spent time scrubbing through the timeline, re-editing things in the edit page and tweaking some color grading. With the larger project, while it functioned, it was definitely not perfect. The timeline buffering time was longer than comfortable. There was stuttered playback and hang ups while scrubbing. To achieve a smooth timeline performance, I had to reduce the project to 1080p, which thankfully Resolve handles effortlessly without needing to rescale any clips or anything like that. However, this does lower the resolution, which isn't ideal in editing a video like this. In contrast, in Premiere, the full 4K project performed flawlessly, super smooth from start to finish. Render times for this project were close, but again, the Resolve project was more demanding. In fact, I didn't even render out the compound clips I created in Resolve to bring into the Premiere project. So on a level playing field, Resolve would have the edge as it makes better use of the AMD hardware encoders than Premiere does but this still isn't an indicator of the overall editing experience, which once again, swings in favor of Premiere. Now we're inching closer to answering the big question, is the Framework 16 right for content creators? But we've still got a few subjective areas to tackle. Let's talk about the noise. Then what we paid for, that's a huge win. If less, it's a letdown. Well, the laptop's cooling system is robust, but unfortunately pretty noisy. Since video editing puts a significant load on the lower to mid tier GPU, the fans are constantly at work. And let's be honest, a noisy environment isn't exactly a video editor's paradise. In contrast, my three year old MacBook Pro handles the same project in blissful silence. Our dedicated graphics, we'll have to see how that affects that. That segues us into the value debate. My base model M1 Pro MacBook Pro, which cost me $1,500 three years ago, delivers flawless timeline performance, no stutters, no freezes, and instant response when skipping around the timeline. It rendered the unboxing project in 42 minutes, all while running on battery power. Now, sure, the MacBook is somewhat specialized for content creators, but it's not a one trick pony. However, someone eyeing the framework isn't likely looking at a Mac. To give you the full picture, I tested Resolve Performance on a desktop PC I built for the same cost as the Framework 16. You can check out that full video here, but spoiler alert, the Ryzen 9 7900X and RTX 4080 super powered system breezed through the timeline and rendered the HEVC video in about 15 minutes. But let's pivot back to direct comparison. When pitting the Framework 16 against a similarly spec 16 inch laptop, we hit the proverbial elephant in the room, 
cost. If we set aside my customizations and pre-build a system with the Ryzen 9 7940HS and RX 7700S graphics, just the basics, no bells and whistles, the price hits $2,500. The only other 16-inch laptop I know of with the same CPU and GPU combo is the Asus TUF A16 Advantage Edition. It's not as modular, but it does offer swappable RAM storage and even the battery. Currently, it's going for about $1,650 on Amazon. That's a $850 price gap for essentially the same performance, or at least a performance difference that won't be noticeable, if at all measurable. At the same price point, or now slightly less thanks to Lenovo's launch of their 2024 model, you can snag a 16-inch laptop with noticeably superior performance, to put it kindly. To sum it all up, the Framework 16 is a mixed bag for video editing. While it offers modularity and repairability that many will appreciate, its performance and demanding tasks like semi-professional video editing is mid-tier despite its high-end price tag. Premiere Pro users might find it more suitable, but for those seeking top-notch performance, alternatives like the MacBook Pro or a custom-built desktop or a higher tier yet comparably priced laptop might be more appealing. However, the Framework 16's potential for future upgrades and its commitment to the right to repair could make it a worthwhile investment for some. And that's it guys, the ins and outs of the Framework 16's performance in the world of video editing. It's been a roller coaster, but the journey doesn't end here. I'll be putting this laptop through its paces with professional workloads in my continuing deep dive series editing each video with the Framework 16 to see how it holds up over time. All right, future CJ here breaking in from up in the studio where you'll notice my Framework 16 is also with a partially completed edit. Now, the entire video is completely edited short of this insert. However, I again had to switch back to my Mac to finish the job. On the Framework, I was able to lay down the A-roll but only managed to get about two minutes into the 15 minute project on the edit page, layering in the B-roll before performance slowed to a point where I wasn't able to continue and resolve. I tried to record this segment last night as it happened, but it's just a frustrated, mostly incoherent creator flailing about in front of a frozen laptop. Long story short, all the issues that were occurring before my smart access memory fix crept back in very quickly to the point where Resolve was just locking up. I was gonna attempt to again move to a proxy workflow, this time going with very simple standard quality H.264 proxies to just use the onboard hardware encoders and decoders. However, this should be a very simple project for a $2,500 laptop. Unfortunately, DaVinci Resolve is a very GPU heavy application and the Framework 16 is just too GPU limited with the lower tier 7700S and AMD's less than stellar professional driver support. The bottom line is, while my conclusion stands for Premiere editors, this is not an ideal laptop for serious Resolve editors, especially those working with modern codecs, over 12-bit footage, HDR log, or RAW files. So keep that in mind as I jump back to pass CJ to finish this video. I'll be sharing updates and insights on my community page and in the comments below, so make sure you're subscribed to catch all the latest. Your support means the world to me, and I can't wait to continue this journey together. Thanks for watching, and until next time, happy editing.